Welcome back to the Sports Booth Podcast. My name is Luke and you're Hello. also joined by my co-host, Husey, as you can hear. How g'day, are you, g'day. Husey? I'm very well, thanks. Very well. Staying dry in this wet, wet weather here in Sydney. Yeah, it's a bit of a downpour, but what we can say is there's been some pretty decent results for our teams over the past uh, few days, especially for yourself. It's a, a few tick, yes. a few boxes yes. ticked, I would say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If only we could say the same for yourself. <laughs> I'll take I'll take what I got with the weekend. We'll say that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. yes, we will be touching base as most of you know who already follow us. It is rugby, rugby league, a bit of American sports, and some Formula One. But the two big ones are the international. Window of rugby has started, and and boy, it was entertaining. And then, mm-hmm. secondly, in another entertaining round of the NRL, um, with all the wet weather, especially uh, in Sydney at the moment, it, it made it exciting. So, we'll we'll get on to the to the league, but first, we'll start off with those uh, international rugby fixtures that have finally finally started after a good Super Rugby and um, club season over in the in Europe. Uh, it yeah. was. It was. There was a couple of big games, and I feel like we should start with the big games first. The the big one is before I said, we get to before we get to the results. Though I just want to say, um, watching international rugby back on the screens uh, this past week, you just reminded how high quality it is and what an incredible game rugby can be, uh, and. Super Rugby season, as we said, you said it was a it was a good season, it was a great season for Super Rugby. It international rugby just it's blown it out of the park. You know, you're looking at these these teams playing the level of skill that's required. The entertainment value of these international games is just is just next level. There's just nothing nothing like it. And look, this might be might be uh, I don't know. It's it's hard it's hard for me to say, but at the moment. Between these two codes, because, you know, we do rugby and rugby league, as you said, it's a toss-up for me between watching international rugby and watching uh, State of Origin. Like, they are both such entertaining spectacles. I think, yeah, what, what and, and that's a great, great point, and I, I, especially with Union, it's just a, it's such another level, like the mm. intensity and the atmosphere, and it, it, it matches State of Origin with, with that part, and, and the thing is, State of Origin, this is where the league has its issue, is it's only three games long, and that... That's pretty much, you know, yeah. it, if, you, if you know what I mean. Not not to say that's it, but, yeah, when you look at rugby and, and it was like you had the New Zealand versus Ireland game, then the Australian versus England game, then you, you know, wake up or if you stay up all night, you've got the Springboks playing Wales and then wake up the next morning to Argentina and Scotland, all of a high level and of, of games of interest. And even the France versus Japan game, which, you know, Probably wouldn't have, everyone would have expect to be such a good game. Rewatching that, I was like, there, there, "There's some good rugby on show," and just the level and the atmosphere yeah. of of international footy. It's I don't think, other than than football, uh, soccer, you have an, an international feeling of that. And and the difference, I feel like, even with international rugby, when you look into it, international rugby, especially like the level, mm. like you said, is so much greater. Even though how great Super Rugby is, whereas you look at Clubs over in in Europe and stuff like that, and football that 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 can sometimes actually jump a level above the international support. So like players or, or fans of of Manchester United would actually rather see Manchester United do well than an England team do well. They would take a Manchester United, you know, Premier League win over a World Cup. So mm. and again, not not all the fans, but some fans would. I don't think you'd see. Many all black, uh, you know, all blacks or Hurricanes fan taking a Super Rugby title over a Rugby World Cup, and vice versa. Like yeah. I don't think you're going to see many Waratahs fans say would take a, a Super Rugby title rather than the World Cup. You know, like that's that's the pinnacle is is international rugby, which I don't think there's another sport in the world that does it quite like that. Yeah, the only thing I could have even comparable would be NRL. With you could see, I could see because it is only as you said three three games but it's it's every year state of origin i think you could see a few people be like i'd rather take um my club winning winning the premiership than my state winning the state of origin in fact i'm probably amongst those fans honestly quite honestly yeah. i'd be it'd be a big big toss-up for me like w- which would i rather rather have and i think because 
um, as a New South Wales fan, we we won last year. You know, it's not that big of a deal is if we if we don't win it uh, this year. It's like okay, well, you know, reset for for next year. The only thing we'd have to do is put up with Queenslanders brag all the time, <laughs> or people who want to be Queenslanders uh, bragging about it. But you know, getting a premiership because you're vying amongst so many other teams for that title, right? You know, you're vying amongst the 16 other teams. It is so difficult to to win a premiership. So. Yeah, I could definitely. I, that, that's the closest comparison I could make. But um, rugby league and rugby league World Cup, t- people would 100 percent take their club winning a premiership over the Kangaroos winning uh, a World Cup. But I don't think that even really counts. It's not on the same scale. Definitely. Uh, but yeah, rugby union, the the international level is truly. I think it is truly the most um, uh, international national game, if you know yeah. what I mean. Where the the national level of competition is the highest level of competition, yep. right? You don't really see that in many other sports. So, 100%. yeah, it's it's amazing when it comes around. Yeah, and, and so let, let's get on to those. I'll run through the results, and then we'll touch base kind of on the games that, that we caught and, mm. and everything. So first game of the weekend was Australia A versus Samoa. Now, a bit of an upset here is Australia A lost 26-31. Uh, second game was Fiji versus Tonga, which again, not I wouldn't say it was so much of an upset, but the scoreline was a surprise as Fiji won 36 nil. Then we had Japan yeah. and France tied 13 all at the break before France uh, ran away with 43 23 winners. The All Blacks beating Ireland 42 19. The Wallabies beating England 30 to 28. The Springboks beating Wales 32-29 with a last-minute penalty, and Argentina beating Scotland 26-18, and, and quite a, a dominant display, to be fair. So I, I think we can we we can touch slight base on the surprise that was Australia A uh, in the Pacific Cup um, losing to, to Samoa. A bit of a surprise, I think, not so much squad-wise and name-wise, but just the fact that I would have expected this Australia A team to be a bit more cohesive than the Samoan team and actually come out of the gates a mm. bit stronger, uh, which I, I don't think it's a bad thing. Like there's a lot of good talent in that Australia A side, and just getting football at this level is a is a is a benefit. They're not getting it, but it will be a little bit disheartening when Dave Rennie looks at that game back to see some of the 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 result and some of the players' performances. I think. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I didn't get a chance to watch the game, but I did get a uh, post match uh, report from one of our. Uh, exclusive sports booth um, contributors, a.k.a. my dad, um, who <laughs> said much the same things, where it was just, yeah, really messy and that, frankly, Australia A were probably pretty lucky to be as close as they were. Yeah, 100%. And then, uh, yeah, the surprise, I, I would say, with the scoreline, Fiji 36, Tonga nil. Now, I truly believe that this is, uh, I want to say, a good indication that the Super Rugby with the Fiji and Duda will do worlds for this Fiji and team. Like, that yeah. was, I think it was a t- 9, 10, 11, 12 for all from the Dura. Um, and you think you've played a whole season together, they're going to be pretty hot shit when they're out there, and, and they did that. Um, yeah. And it kind of overshadowed what, which was Tonga's big day with Izzy Falau and uh, Charles Piatau, uh both starting, you know, on the wing and fullback for them. And this kind of new idea that Tonga was going to be a force in rugby with with the players de- 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 defecting and uh, Malachi Fikatora as well starting in the centres. But to keep it kept to nil in a game where you're kind of trying to make a statement and now Israel Folau getting an injury, it's it's a it's a backward step just about for Tonga. I know it's still they would be better than they yep. were before without these players, but it was a, it was a big statement, I think, by Fiji um, and some good momentum for them heading into into kind of a, a good time, you know, this and then the World Cup next year. Yep. Absolutely, 100% agree. Yeah, and then we jump into Japan and France. France sending over a B team as they, as they tend to do with these uh, uh, free match series, middle of the game series, and uh, coming away with just enough of a win. Uh, I would say they'd be a little bit disappointed, but I think Japan hung in there long enough to probably deserve a result, and that's where they'll be probably most disappointed uh, watching that game back. Mm. Let's get into the big boys. Uh, the four Southern Hemisphere teams, the four big boys against the four... You can say big boys of the Northern Hemisphere, um, minus France, yep. obviously. Uh, All Blacks uh, kicked us off with a, a convincing 42-19 win over Ireland. Uh, as our resident All Blacks fan and New Zealander here, I must say I was a little nervous, a little nervous after the uh, first Irish try. I was like, they're building some phases yeah. here. They are looking better than I expected. Um, but I guess 
the second half and, and all that that second part of that first half especially uh, made me a lot a lot happier with the side, uh, a lot happier with the attack that I saw. And then rounding it off the defence at the end, I was pretty damn impressed with what I saw um, on the goal line. Yeah. Uh, although they scored two tries in the end, I still think uh, – it was. It was. It gave me a bit more confidence going into the series that we're going to a whitewash them and b looking forward into the rugby championship. Yeah, the All Blacks were very, very impressive. I mean, when are they not really? Uh, it was. Yeah, um, you know, there were a few whispers around. Maybe Ireland might might pull off an upset or something. They've had uh, the better of the results in the last five games or something. I guess you know they. they They'd never beaten New Zealand up until like 2015, and then since then they're three and two against them. So, you know, bit of a bit of speculation there. But then, yeah, All Blacks just just turned it on, and everyone realised that wow, this is a really good team. Still not number one in the world rugby rankings <laughs> since the, the Springboks won, but I think they they passed the eye test as probably the best team in the world right now. Definitely. Uh, and then we'll move into the Wallabies game. Obviously, I'm going to let you yeah. run us through that, but I do want to mention the big news pre-kickoff that was, was actually monumental news. I want, I want that said, like, yeah. watching sitting here, just getting ready for the game, you know, you're 10 minutes out just about, and all of a sudden, yep. Clade Cooper is out of the test match. It must have mm-hmm. sent, as, as an Australian, Noah's had his question marks, uh, less yeah. about his ability and more about his big-time decision-making. And then you're heading into a game with England. Run us through that game, your feelings before that game as Quade's been ruled out and everything like that. Um, honestly, I was nervous for Noah for his defensive um, capabilities um, more than anything, really. Uh, and being thrust into the limelight like this. Uh, and then sort of as we got into the game and things started to, to pile on a bit, you know, um, Tom Banks breaking his oh. arm in a horrific looking injury <laughs> um like mr rubber kind of thing that was yeah, uh bad. darcy <laughs> swain getting the red card and everything like that thoughts, um, thoughts you know, on the red O'Connor. card when you mentioned that just thoughts on the oh, red card. I, well, I'll, 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 I'll come back to the red okay, card because cool. i've got a little bit to say about it but um then you know darcy swain getting the card um I, you know james o'connor was up in the 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 press booth five minutes before kickoff in a suit like he was not ready to play. I'm sure he knocked back a drink or two before that. As well. <laughs> and then, and then he's being uh, he's got to warm up and everything like that. But I think it was fucking amazing by the Wallabies the way that they responded to those challenges and no one seemed disturbed by it. No one seemed off their game. The way that they started the game, you would have thought Noah was had been the ten the whole time. Um, I guess the only thing was it took uh, them a little bit to get some attacking movement together, but. Quite honestly, and it's going to sound brutal, I think that was actually Andrew Kellaway being moved back to fullback gave him a bit more options there than Tom Banks. And I, as listeners will know, I went on a, a spiel last week in previous weeks that Jordan Pattaya should be the, the fullback, but I'm converting around to Andrew Kellaway now because he had a great game. He was always in position. He's exactly where he needed to be. His defense was good as well. Pattaya did some good things out on the wing as well. Strong runner, but still added some playmaking ability in there. So all around, I think, a great performance by the Wallabies. I actually think the scoreline is closer than what England deserved to be. 100%. Uh, those last and that, two tries that's going to loop us back to the, the red <laughs> card. So first of all, uh, Johnny Hill, go fuck yourself. Get a proper heck of me. <laughs> and, second, and second of all, you're lucky. He's lucky he wasn't red carded because he full on punched Darcy Swain five minutes before he pulled his hair as well. Look, I get it. Darcy Swain's a good looking rooster with that haircut and everything like that as well. <laughs> but this isn't the playground anymore. If you like the bloke, slap him on the ass and tell him after the game you want his number. Don't start getting into it on the field. And I think oh. England were very, very lucky that he got away with that. As well, though, I will give him credit. It's excellent gamesmanship. It is that is what Test rugby is to a certain extent. You got to have those heels in there who will push the other team and get them to make a stupid decision, like what Darcy Swain did make. And the, everything I've just said does not excuse Darcy Swain at all. Right? He did headbutt a guy. He deserved the card. He deserved to go. He was pushed there, sure, but that doesn't matter. At the end of the day, he did it. He deserved the card. Off he goes. Hill was lucky to escape with only a yellow. But again, it shows the grit and resolve of this Australia team. This is twice in as many years they've played for the majority of a game, a man down, and 
come out on top and not against B grade sides either. Against the two rugby last rugby World Cup finalists, in fact, the winners South Africa and the runners up England. So I think it was tremendous work from the Wallabies. I loved Dave Parecki in his <laughs> debut. Looked like he'd been there forever. And Caden Neville as well, 33, 34 years old, looked. They were two of the Wallabies' best forwards. Yeah, 100%. Totally agree, especially with that last statement. I, I sat there as an All Blacks fan, as we all know, and I went, fuck, mm. Dave Pricky, fuck, a motherfucker, fuck. Because it's been yeah. one of your holes for a while, and it's like, yeah, we can bank them not having a good hooker. Now you've got a really good one-two punch, I think, there, because you've got Dave Pricky, who we saw couple of times been out on the wing and making good meters yeah. where I was like he's a mobile hooker he hit all his throws he he did everything like absolutely everything right and I go bugger because that has me a little bit nervous and then you've got Flaufanger yeah. who comes on and adds that punch uh, knows how to to get the, the back of the mall and then find the try line yeah. so I think that that's really the way he played perfect example of what you need from your hooker then Caden Neville, oh wow, I was blown away. I think I, I read on the stats afterwards, 17 tackles without a miss in your debut game mm. against a big English pack. He was annoying at, at, at um, line-out time, especially yeah. with his locking partner down, I thought. Again, that's two debutants, like you said, who are late in the years. It was the talk of the town who showed up in a big way and showed the Australian way, uh, for that, mm-hmm. for, especially for that game. And, and I think, again, Noah Lolisio had had a good game. I don't think he had the best game. He did everything that was asked of no. him. Um, I yep. actually, and, and this is the scary thing, there's two scary things I kind of take away from that game. I think Nick White, up until about the 65th minute, had a pretty shit game when I watched what no, yeah. Nick White had done. And I go, if he can get his stuff together and play like Nick White plays, I think you could be a lot better. Um, and that's not to say I think anyone else deserves a shot because when he gets his shit together, I think some of those plays he, he started to make were Nick White plays, but I thought he had a pretty average performance to there. And then secondly, I do yeah. want to just quickly speak on, I actually think as bad as the result looks for England, I actually think there was lots of good for them to take from it. Their attack scares the living hell out of me. They play deep and they play behind balls and it takes... A couple of breaks and I think a couple of momentum sticks to to really for them to stick the knife into teams. And, and you saw it at the end there with those two tries. Like When they get the momentum up, I think it'll be a hard team to stop because of the way they play. And a, a couple of those big boys, and especially in the pack, who was, as, as I think Joe Muller said, was meant to eat you guys alive and, and definitely yeah. didn't. I, I, yeah, I, I, I looked there and I was like... As a Kiwi, as an All Black fan, not happy either way with that result, really. Uh, mm. The Wallabies look good with a man down, and the English still look good even though they played like ass. So I, I saw enough there with Marcus Smith and Aaron Farrell where I was like, oh, the team's just stepping up there. Yeah. This is no longer just the All Blacks run show. Yeah, look, I, I agree with that. That was one of the things that uh, I was thinking throughout the game is that the Wallabies, when they had ball in hand, we're making some of the usual wallaby mistakes. So hopefully by the end of the series and by the time we get to the rugby championship, those will sort of sort themselves out. I agree with you with the Nick White thing. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I I mean, as a Waratahs fan, I'm a bit biased towards Jake Gordon, who I do really quite like. Um, and yeah I, I, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to know which one I'd rather have on first, which one I have on later. I think Jake Gordon coming with five minutes left to go was not enough time for him to put any kind of stamp on the game, and it's a time when he could have been used with like 15 minutes left to go with his running speed and things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, this game was about the the forwards of the Wallabies and them uh, really getting it done. I think both the centers, though, like looking at the back line, both centers had a had a great game. Karevi and Ikitao, uh, particularly Karevi, um, just a, a a monster. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of times he just absolutely battered people uh, through there as well. Um, Corabete, same and then uh, Corabete as well. As well. Yeah. Always, he, his his standard is excellence. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> he's always great. And then Callaway shifting from the wing to fullback and Bataya going out on the wing. Great knocks from from both and particularly Callaway, who coming into this, I was a bit like, oh, I don't don't know if I really want him on a wing. Uh, like I don't know if I really want him in the starting side just because of the the how the Rebels went this season. Yeah. But he showed what he can do with with other not bad players. It's not even. He, he doesn't even need other, like, amazingly good players around him. He just needs players that aren't bad, yep. and he, he'll step up. And he, and he showed that there. So, you know, with the injuries and Darcy Swain 
out, you know, suspended now. It's going to be interesting to see what they do for the next game. You know, um, is Quaid still the starting 10 with how Noah played and his, his goal kicking? Uh, you know, who goes into the full-time fullback role, everything like that. So there's a few questions ahead of the next test that Dave Rennie will need to answer in the upcoming days. Definitely. Uh, so, yeah, that was a good win for the Wallabies as they go 1-0 up in that series. The Springboks, uh, South Africa... Just mm. got over the line against Wales with a last-minute penalty um, by Willemese, their fullback, um, which was a bit of a surprise to, I think, everyone, uh, the fight that the Welsh put up against the South African pack yeah. at home. Um, and I haven't got, a, I didn't get a chance to watch that game back, only the highlights package. Um, but that Willemese out the back, fullback for South Africa, looks like another star, so that's great as well. And then Argentina, um, 26, Scotland, 18. Uh, I rewatched that game. And the uh, little number nine, I've forgotten his name, I think it's Bernascada or something like that, I thought was fantastic as well. And I was like, oh, man, there's so much good talent on display. And uh, we both picked Scotland there, but uh, Argentina getting the job done at home. Yeah. So I've got some questions now. So the first question is the Wallabies back line for the next game. Name it for me, Husey. Okay. Honestly, I don't think you change it from what this game uh, was for the majority of it. So Nick White, 9. Noah at Lollasia at 10. Uh, then uh, Karevi, Ikitao, Korobete, Pattaya, and Kellaway at fullback. I think yep. that they worked well together, right? They executed some backline moves that... Honestly, it's been a while since I've seen the Wallabies execute some backline moves <laughs> like that. That looked smooth. Kellaway knew where to be. I think that's really important. A really important trait for a fullback to be in attack is to know where to be and when to be there. Um, and because it's, you know, you've got to... It's not only... Because it's not only about where you are, it's about where your opposite number is and creating those holes in the defensive line and things like that. Uh and I think that's something the Wallabies haven't done particularly well lately. And I think I saw some a lot of improvement there with with Callaway uh, at the back there. Uh, so because I think Banks has got some individual brilliance, yep. but maybe not necessarily meshes as well in a team. Whereas I think Callaway provides that a bit more. So yeah, essentially what the backline was for the majority of this game. Keep with that. Uh, that's what I would go with as well. I think if I was going yeah. there. Um, now, I actually have a slight prediction I've chucked out there. Um, I'm going to mm -hmm. chuck out there. And as we all know, I'm, pr I'm pretty good with my predictions, my heart, my takes as as, as we yep. talk. As Except we, for NRL. Yeah, the Dragons and yeah, that team from the Gold Coast that I always predict to win and never wins. But um, yep. as we go on, I am actually predicting a Wallabies Rugby Championship win. Now you're gonna ask. Ooh, you're okay. gonna say. You're gonna say why it's not. You're not winning the bleeder slow, so don't get too far ahead of yourselves. But okay. the way the the rugby championship is set up this year is you're doing games at another country's like another country's hosting for two weeks. So mm -hmm. the All Blacks have to play South Africa twice in South Africa. Okay. okay. South Africa have to play Australia twice. In Australia, Australia has to play Argentina twice. In Argentina, Argentina has to play the All Blacks twice. In Argentina, now my thinking is, you go to Argentina, beat Argentina twice. South Africa comes to you. There's a good chance after what I saw last year that you have a, a chance to beat them. Yeah, the All Blacks having to go to South Africa, which you know they're going to be up for now that the number one ranked team in the world, South Africa. Is no easy feat. So your two losses that inevitably are going to happen against the All Blacks is going to be cancelled out, I feel. Um, and I think that that's where we see an Australian one rugby championship. Wow. So we, but we would also need to have the bonus points and, and things bonus like points that. and stuff and like that. And I mean, you could take a game yeah. in Melbourne. I'm not saying you will, but you're not winning at Eden Park, so the Bledisloe is not going back. But there yeah. could be a, an opportunity there. And I just, from mm -hmm. even as much as I want to say how good the All Blacks were on the weekend, there's holes there still. Like, like you know, there, there, there was you know a good first 20 minutes of me being a bit worried about Ireland, and I'm still yet to be fully convinced with this side. And I don't think. Yeah, I just there was there was moments in games over the weekend where I said 
actually I like what the other teams like other teams are doing. So I liked what England was doing with the out the back plays. I liked what the Wallabies are doing with their hard, strong carries in the back line and, and then setting it up for, for, you know, Callaway and slick hands and stuff. I just there's a lot of I like, whereas I think the All Blacks are relying heavily on individual brilliance. And we saw it with Aaron Smith's try, we saw it with Artie Savia's yeah. try, you know. We are individual brilliance because we have great players, but that's not going to win us considerable games. So I think, yeah, there's. I just, mm. I just think that the challenge that we have of going to South Africa and winning twice, um, having to play Australia once in Melbourne and once at home, I just think there's a good opportunity here for the Wallabies to really build some momentum heading into the World Cup next year. I, I have some faith in Dave Rennie um, and the squad they're selecting and building with Dan McCullough as their forwards coach. I just think <coughs> I'm not getting nervous of a of a famous Bledisloe Cup loss, but I'm getting nervous of a, a Wallabies resurgence under under Rennie. Uh, I see more good than bad, uh, which yeah. I never like. Fair enough. Well, I'll, I'll, I've got no comment to make on that. <laughs> I hope you're right. You're so. just sitting there looking happy. You know, <laughs> yep, yeah, I just I'll take it. You know. Uh, so that's my big prediction. Um, if we if we go off my past predictions, let's be not let's be honest. Yeah, haven't been right, so I probably won't be right about that. But let's jump into the NRL, uh, NRL unless you've got anything yeah. more you want to add about the international rugby window. Uh, I, I just that um, I just uh, something you've noted here, and what we I think we both think about the Springboks win is that it was surprising. It was that close, and I think it does uh, lend some hope for your prediction for Australia to win a rugby championship. And I think it's I think both Australia and New Zealand fans will look at that and. Uh, uh, and, and be with, eye some, uh, yeah. with some <laughs> hope in their eyes and a little bit of a gleam yep. in there. I mean, let's be honest, everyone likes seeing South Africa lose. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> even if they're playing England, I probably would prefer at the moment South Africa to lose just because they're so fucking good at the moment. Yep. So, yeah, uh, let's go into the NRL. Round 16, the good, bad yes. and the ugly. I will kick us off with the good... The great, it's the Warriors back at home and yes. showing that they can win. How fantastic was that? That was probably one of the well more, more incredible games to watch, more incredible atmospheres to see, sell out of Mount Smart, just mm. the feeling, the performance the boys put in. Uh, my you know, my, my second team slash now becoming slowly my first team because my first team sucks. Um, yep. And I just think that was, that was just, it was just, it was great because they'd been in such a toil and you were like, can the Warriors actually turn up for when when the, the when it matters most to be at home, and showing and that the fact that they did I think was was fantastic. Now obviously there's been a lot of chatter. How do we how do we, you know, respect the Warriors and how do we show them the love that that you know keep staying in this competition and everything? I don't think it's with home games just at the Warriors because I think if they go on to win yeah. a championship, then they. Um, it's a, an, an asterisk next to it. So, yeah, the Warriors just being at home, I thought, was fantastic. The atmosphere was great there, and you can definitely tell uh, what it meant to the players and the fans to have them back. Um, and, yeah, it must have been such a relief for them. I heard Torhu Harris after the game saying, like, I actually have a locker now. Like, I, <laughs> we feel like we have somewhere permanent That's we have our space back, which is so important for a team's mindset, really. And, like... Uh, having a home ground that you could take pride in and things like that, and having your fans there, uh, amazing and great for the sport. Um, yeah, it's a huge, huge thing for, for rugby league, and we saw the fans uh, show up for it. So, and the fact that they got a win, you know, hopefully they could take some of the momentum forward. Hopefully they can, you know, build more fans and things like that out through New Zealand and everything like that. Take some more players away from New Zealand Rugby Union, weaken the All Blacks. <laughs> Let us like cup time. So there you go. Good plan. Good it all plan. comes all falls back again. Yeah, that's the ultimate goal. Hughes's ultimate goal. <laughs> How can we yep. get the Bledisloe like, Cup back? Uh, um, so on to and the, it, oh, you know what it starts with the the West Tigers. That's how it starts. <laughs> the Bledisloe Cup. Who would have thought? Who would have thought it would have been the West Tigers kicking us off? Yes. Uh, yep. What I thought was bad for the round. I'm just going to get it out of the way. It's a team from the Gold Coast. Mm. We we both picked them to win. Uh, I don't know why I did either because of. Because I, I bet you that they wouldn't win again until August or until the Dragons <laughs> won again. And I still picked them because I just thought, it's the Knights. The they Knights, have to. Uh, if, if there were ever going to be a win, it had terrible. to be this yeah. week. It um, had to be this, you know. And I think the Knights were playing without Ponga as well because of concussion no Ponga, and things like yeah. that. It was, like, it was set up for the win. What else have the Knights win. got? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah I, I sit there and I go, 
If there was ever a time they were going to get a win, it was this round. And they not only did they not get the win, they never looked like winning. They gave up mm. eight tries total to the wingers, five to big old Edric Lee. It was it was miserable. I, I I go back to my first comment at the start of the season where I said I was a bit nervous about Jamal Fogarty being let go. Now, I said that, and again, the Raiders may not be making the greatest moves, but I can tell you a hell of a lot. I, I, I would rather better. be in the... Raiders position than I am currently sitting here with the team in Gold Coast down in 16. So I honestly, I think there's a good chance we're in for a spoon. And I I just, yep. to, to think we're in round 16 in 16 weeks, you know, that's four months it's taken us to go from, oh, we're going to finish 6th, 7th to, no, we are more than likely going to finish 16th. It's just, I, I'm, I'm in disbelief. I don't think Holbrook should go as a Titans supporter, <coughs> team from Gold Coast supporter. Uh, but I do think... It has to be now on the radar. Like, post. like, what, what is going on? Like, I, 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 I had faith mm. in it. I thought we were heading in the right direction, and it just, it hasn't gone in the right direction, which is a little bit disappointing. Um, so yeah, that, that's my bad for the round. Mm, on yes. to, I think it was very bad. Yeah, yeah. I can agree with that. <laughs> I don't think it could get any worse. That was the worst of the rounds of all the rounds. Um. What I thought was ugly for the round, uh, the weather, which we t- we touched on earlier, was staying yeah. staying dry, but the weather is actually terrible. Uh, you can tell in the the dogs. This is the sharks game. Was was the pick of the bunch? I must say it was absolutely incredible to watch that game and just be like, man, they looked like they were playing pipe footy. Now it rains a lot in New Zealand, and I must say the drainage at the stadiums must be a hell of a lot better because you don't often see that. But yeah, that was it was as bad as like. It was. It, it made it for interesting footy because you just never get conditions like that at Combank Stadium. I was yep. like, that is so interesting to see. And even at the newer Core Stadium, it was. It was just like, like yeah, very different when you know Burton can't even put up his bombs because the ball's probably rock hard and he can't get a, a, a plant foot down. It yeah. was just. It was ugly, but it was a great ugly. I don't want to. It's not a bad ugly. It was just ugly. Yeah. But piggybacking off the back of that, the conditions in the Dragons and Raiders game with something like 60 kilometer an hour winds or things like that, <laughs> watching when the team was kicking into the wind, the ball going forward and they're just curving backwards, back towards their own line and things like that. It's just incredible uh, conditions to play in. And look, both teams dropped balls off of kicks because of the wind, just make it so unpredictable. Uh, and it set us up for a grandstand finish in that game. Um, but yeah, the weather definitely was ugly this week. Um so, yeah, definitely agreeing with the assessment of the weather for the NRL this round. Uh, on to you, mate. Your, 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 your time for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So so my good for the round uh, was, uh, and I really uh, I really wish we had like some sound effects going now of like a wrestling intro music is <laughs> big, bad, <laughs> Latrell Mitchell rising from the grave like The Undertaker and just honestly destroying the Parramatta Eels out for blood out for vengeance and after the game just being like no nah, I don't need to play State of Origin I'm focusing <laughs> on the South this year and just oh my goodness just dominating the the Parramatta Eels looking like whatever uh, ectoplasm or platelets he got injected into himself <laughs> over in America whatever like sci-fi technology Robocop shit he got done over there um, absolutely worked because he looked fantastic and i i don't know if this is necessarily as well what contributed to his form but he does follow the sports booth so i'm sure that played a part <laughs> like listening to our cutting edge analysis of teams and things like that i'm sure he's he was listening to the sports booth before he he played you could see him with the headphones on so i'm sure he was listening to our last episode and getting g'd up for that um so yeah latrell mitchell was my good for the round and he was bloody good incredible yeah can't i can't even i can't Top what you've just said, like he was absolutely yeah. fantastic. Flip side of that is the other team that played in that game. Um, and we recently had our Super Rugby Awards, right, where we handed out some various awards. I've got a new award, actually. <laughs> uh, the, the Parramatta Eels are winning, and it's the Soggy Bread Award for the worst fucking consistency I've ever seen. Like, Jesus Christ, the Parramatta Eels go from laying the schmack down on uh, the Roosters to laying an absolute egg against the Rabbitohs. You know, they go from putting up 40-odd points on my Dragons, beating the Storm, beating the Panthers, to losing to the Tigers, to losing to the Bulldogs. This team, 
right, must be sponsored by a pacemaker company or something like that because their fans <laughs> are having heart attacks week in and week out, never knowing what they're going to get. Forrest Gump style, life is like a box of chocolates. Which Mitchell Moses are you going to get kind of thing? Like, yes. it's insane. Like, I can't figure out this team for the life of me. Some weeks they look like absolute world beaters up there with the Panthers, with the Storm, with the Cowboys, the Roosters, Premiership winning teams. Other weeks, they look like they've been pulled up from Jersey flag or something like that. And (laughs) you just, it's, and it's horrible. And so they win the Soggy Bread Award for the worst consistency in NRL. Uh, So that was my bad for the round. And arguably could have been, could have been the ugly, but um, there is something in the NRL, Luke, that is even uglier than poor, team consistency and that is uh refereeing being the focus of games and we saw it in origin 2 saw it in the dragons and raiders game saw it in the roosters and panthers game refereeing being in the spotlight helps no one not even the referees so uh that's my ugly throughout is refereeing being brought back into the focus deservedly so i guess for some of the calls that were made you know even the end of that dragons raiders game i'll say it dragons we were bloody lucky to to get away without a penalty right in front of the goalpost yeah. there uh so yeah that's my ugly the, the other thing i sort of had on there for for ugly is is that the broncos and i debated this one and so it's not my primary ugly but it's worthy of discussion i think yeah. is the broncos rush players back from injury to play in the derby game now at first when i saw this i just sort of thought well you know why are you rushing back Reynolds and, and, and Payne Haas, you know, give them a week off. But then I thought, you know what, though? It's the Derby game. Like, this is a big game that Queenslanders have got circled on their calendars. This is an important game of the year. This is the only two Queensland teams in the competition um, because, this, you know, let's be real. So it's important to know who, who wins Ooh. this one. And so, Gosh. you know, and I thought of it, you know, like I'm a passionate NFL fan and – the Steelers players will come back early from injury to play in their rivalry games against the Ravens and things like that. And sometimes, you know, it is worth it to, to cop a little bit of extra injury time to, to get into that game and to perhaps be the difference between winning and losing when the rivalry is that fierce. So at first it was my ugly, but it's more so my ugly, the fact that these players re-aggravated the injuries like Payne Haas, who's missing out on origin and Adam Reynolds, who clearly was, um, not back to 100%. Uh, so it's just ugly, I guess, in the way that those guys play through the pain and didn't get the result. Yeah, I think in, in, my, in my belief that the big picture has to be seen here. Like, they yeah. probably didn't want to get smoked in two derby games or derby games, so I see why they probably tried to rush a couple of players back for this one to make sure that it was at least competitive and just to make a bit of a statement. But... In the end, would you rather lose two derby games during the season and win when it counts if you play them in the finals? Probably. So big picture thinking, you don't want to rush guys on. Like it's lucky Haas is only out for two to three weeks and not not longer. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. And, again, like it's a tough decision to make. And you'd have all, all – they, they've got all the information in front of them right over where are just saying, look, it didn't look like it was quite right and this and that. So, I mean, they you'd hope they would do what's best for the players, but I'm sure some of those players would have been saying, nah, get me on that field. And, and I've done it myself. Yeah. I have physios and stuff like that, and I refuse to take their advice. It's it's You just want to be out there. You don't want to be watching your, your team lose. So, yeah, it's tough. But talking about Payne Haas missing origin, team discussion for the state mm. of O. The teams have been named. Not – a couple of force changes. Um, so we'll start with New South Wales. The only force change, really, Jordan McLean comes in for Haas. The big decisions are Burden and Crichton starting in the centres and Talakai still on the bench with Jack White in 18th man. As Mr New yeah. South Welshman, you happy? Yeah, yeah I, look, I look sort of at... I mean, you look at what Parramatta did this week and Regan Campbell-Gillard had a chance to play himself back into the New South Wales squad and, and did it. Jordan McLean has and the Cowboys have been have been great and there's a reason why both those Cowboys props have been uh, called up into their respective Origin sides now uh, and you can see now why McLean was included in the camp for for Origin too. It's you know if we, if we have to play without Haas, who steps into that role? Um, so yeah, I quite I, I I think it's good. I think it's good to keep that consistency because that team was firing on all cylinders in that in that Origin too. So why move it around? I think that the biggest question would Mark for people would have been, you know, Talakai at 17 or Whiten at 17. Um, 
I think Whiten's good to have at 18. I think he provides everything you want out of an 18th man. Um, whereas, and you, it's, you know, the player you need is shit goes wrong. Whereas Talakai's good to be in there um, as an injection. Um, he only played limited minutes in Origin 2, but he ran hard and was hard to, to, to put down by the Queensland players in that one, given they were probably exhausted from uh, running after Nathan Cleary scoring all those tries and things like that, but uh, all trying to chase down Matt Burton bombs. But uh, yeah, I quite like the, the squad here. Um, but I mean, look, I've liked all of uh, Fittler's squad selections, even even the Origin 1 team. Uh, you know, we can say back in hindsight now, Jake Dubrovich's uh, non-inclusion in game one was the, the biggest uh, mistake, uh, probably of Fittler's. I say it's his second biggest mistake of his Origin coaching career after uh, not having a spare back on the field uh, on the bench two years ago when yep. uh, Tedesco went down. I'd say that that was probably, this was probably his second biggest mistake. I don't think it, it was as impactful as it was not having a back on the bench for, yep. for that game and for that series. Um, you know, there was a, there was a lot more in game one and they, they came close in game one. They almost, um, they almost uh, tied it up at the end there in game one. So what definitely wasn't the biggest thing, but it, but it adds to it. Uh, so yeah, look, there's there's not really much to say. We saw what this team can do in game two. I think Burton and Crichton have done enough to hold on to their spots. Uh, there's no, as well as Whiten played uh, in game one, Burton and Crichton played really well in, in, in game two. And there's no way Matt Burton's being taken off that team. Yeah. Uh, and so it was really about Crichton or not. And I think Crichton did enough in that game to to retain his spot. Definitely, I agree with that. I I Jordan McLean's an interesting one as a selection. Like I look at it and I go. You know, obviously I'm a bit happier that it's not Payne Haas and it's Jordan McLean. But it's not like his selection makes me that happy. Like, the, the players around him, mm. I don't think it matters as much as probably a couple of years ago it probably would have, if you know what I mean. Like, pre, like, yeah. say there was no Trebojevic and uh, Latrell in there and Payne Haas was out, I would have been like, shit, yeah, and McLean's in there, I would have been like, this is great. But I look around and I'm like, actually, the fact that they're, they're getting to choose between Burt and Christ and Talakai and White and is more of a factor than McLean being in there, or even if it, even if it was Regan Campbell Gillard, like I don't think it's that much, you know, different. I think that the fact that they've got Jake in there now, and and you know, Cam Murray, Liam Martin, Jose, yo, Crichton back in there, Junior Paulo coming off the bench. I'm like, you know, Max things he he plays twenty minutes or fifteen minutes to come on, then um, Paulo comes on and and does what Paulo does for about you know forty forty five fifty minutes, and then he finishes it off. Yeah. So I'm not, I, I'm still I'm. I'm happy it's not Haas, but it, it's it's it doesn't give me as much energy as I as it once would have. But if we go into the Queensland team, the one necessary change is uh, Nanai coming in for Kafusi, who is in the US uh, um, for personal reasons, um, and then Tom Gilbert comes into that bench spot, which is is quite interesting. Uh, I don't I. I Nanai is such a hit and miss player, and everyone was you know interested in this because he. Didn't have a game, good game too. But again, I, I I will stay by my fact that I don't think he's been used correctly. And I think getting him in the starting lines up, up gives it the opportunity to use him correctly. What he should be used for is bomb it and get that boy to run after the ball because I don't know how many tries he scored off the back of bombs already. He's an attacking player and he will get caught out in defences. He averages like a ridiculous amount of missed tackles a game, like three to four. So that will be his downfall is if he doesn't get that right it will cost Queensland and, and maybe Queensland the series. If he gets that right and, and can hold on to that, then he could be a game-breaker in there. So I do like it. I just think he's going to need, some given some direction, they're going to have to have him drilled to, you've got to make this tackle, you've got to be there, got to be there. And then Tom Gilbert, like you said, has earned it, like McLean as a, as a Cowboys yeah. player to come onto that side. So again, it's the fact that, that Munster's in there, you never know what can happen as long as you've got Munster in there. So yeah. it's going to be a hell of a game to decide the series. Um, and I guess, you know, after Wednesday, we'll find out if all these decisions were the right decisions. And is, it, is this Wednesday, is it? Yes? No? Uh, that's a that's a very good question. I believe it's next Surely. Wednesday, actually. Is it next Wednesday and they've made the teams, decided the teams this early? Look. No, it's this Wednesday. It's this I, Wednesday. I, I, it is, uh, is Wednesday? No, it's next Wednesday. Is it next Wednesday? Yeah, I thought so. And like, it's a bit soon because they haven't gone back into to training because they've got the they've got yeah, the games this weekend. Next Wednesday. And then it's yeah, I was like, I'm sure it's next weekend. Uh, next Wednesday, sorry, because we've got uh, games this weekend. Yeah, thirteenth. Do we right? Yeah, thirteenth. So next Wednesday. It's just it's interesting. They've named them very early, haven't they? But 
again, it's good. I'd rather yeah. it that way than, than delaying it. But yes, so we'll be looking forward to that in a couple of Wednesdays' time. Anything else on the NRL? Just one, radar? yeah. So I just got a, I've got a, uh, as as a Queensland supporter, I have a question for you here. Yep. Um, Gagai still in the centre position despite his performance in Origin Two. There's no what one else. Thoughts? No one else we can put in there. I think that would if the hammer. The hammer hasn't been playing enough footy in my eyes because he's coming off the bench for them at the moment. Um, so I go. Looking at all that, yeah, I Dane Gay guys are hit or miss, and I, I, I again I would prefer him on a wing, but when you don't have we don't have that luxury, um, I, I truly believe so. No, I again, Gay guy can defend at centre. He is known to be run over by a Telekai bus before, um, but yep. I think it's the the only choice they have. And that first game he did enough, um, so it's going to have to be the. Can he do enough again in the centres? Again, I prefer him on the wing, and hopefully one day we will have a centre who can. And outplay him and push him back onto the wing, but for now I'm I'm happy yep. for 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 that. Again, I don't think there's anyone better as as much as Hammer's got that X factor, but I think Hammer would you have Hammer and um and I, um, I think the fact that they've got a full week in training together, um, him and Nan I on the same side, I believe, uh, that'll that'll help at least for their defensive efforts. Shall we move on to a quick discussion of the NBA? I don't know if you've seen much of the NBA, yeah. but I'm going to give you a run through because a shitload has Said happened. a couple of things. Uh, multi-million yep. dollar moves have happened, but the biggest two that I have noted is obviously the Brooklyn Nets are falling apart mm. um, as Kevin Durant uh, drives this bus off a cliff and decides to derail the team. So he's asked for a trade, which is looking likely, and Kyrie Irving wants out as well so it would possibly be, be traded as well which wouldn't surprise me two uh, biggest trades at the moment that are looking likely is Kyrie Irving to the Lakers for a Russell Westbrook mm. package to reunite with LeBron himself and then KD back to the Warriors is actually looking like it could happen again which again yeah. as much as I would like this Brooklyn experiment to go on for another year it's probably interest makes the league again another hell of a lot interesting. And this is again, this is where Super Rugby Rugby League even that miss yeah. trick is this off season news. You know, this is just incredible. That like day one, all of these just happening is just mind boggling. Yeah. Just quickly on those, I just got to say, fuck Kevin Durant, man. Like <laughs> Jesus Christ, like. He goes to, like, all these franchises just trying... Like, I get it. He's trying to chase the title, but he just lays down these demands, asks for a shit ton of money, gets injured half the time, isn't available to play, and then just storms off when he he thinks don't, don't go his way. You know? Like, geez, like off the field, he seems like a, a great... A great off the court, I should say. He seems like a great guy with lots of great initiatives out there. But fuck, man, I I don't know if I would want him to come to my franchise because I'm, we, you know, like it's so boom or bust. And for the majority of times, it's been bust, right? Yeah. The only times it was boom was when he went to a franchise that already had superstars on the end and already won titles without him. And you could argue that he wasn't the factor that made them win more titles, right? 100%. So I don't know, man. It's just. That's what he's I, done to the Brooklyn Nets, like how how long is it going to take for the Nets to recover from this? I potentially potentially not that long, and this is what I think. Uh, Sean Marks, who's a New Zealand basketball player, is actually the the general manager of the the Brooklyn Nets, and I think mm. they're actually in the best position to get out of this. All right, like they went into that. You you say if you get the chance to have Kevin Durant and Kyrie and even James Harden at a time, and you say that to any franchise, they're probably taking that opportunity just to give it a shot. Like, there's a chance you win yeah. a championship with those three. Obviously, it didn't happen. Now you've got Ben Simmons still, which, as much as, you know, he's caused problems, he's in Brooklyn, he will be their go-to guy if they trade these two guys. You're going to get a mm. shitload of young players if you go to the Warriors, you trade him to the Warriors. You also potentially get a Russell Rest book that, as much as he may not be the player he once was, can still add something to this team and maybe maybe just give Ben Sim Simmons a bit of that, you know, just that grit and determination to win. So as much as Brooklyn's in, in, in trouble at the moment, if they, they could work, walk out of this still successful and still with a chance at a title because it, it wasn't too long ago, and I know Ben Simmons was at the 76ers with Embiid and Harrison stuff, stuff but 
they were they were considered at least one of the top title contenders. I don't think they're yeah. too far away. You know, you get Anthony Wiggins, you get Russell Westbrook. Even if you can package that up and get a, a decent big man in there, and even if they get Wiseman and a couple other pieces from the Golden State Warriors, I think they can actually do something here that, you know, they'll turn around and go, actually, two, three years down the line, you know, once this Golden State Warriors team ages a bit more and a bit more and they're still, you know, they're taking their picks, this it could it could work out in their favour. And I, I remember a very yeah. famous trade once upon a time, which was the Boston Celtics trading to the Brooklyn Nets, funnily enough, the other way around, Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce for a shitload of draft picks, a, a buttload. And it lasted about one season, and the, 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 the Nets fouled completely flat, stunk it up, and for the next five years or so were rebuilding and all their draft picks were just going to the, the Boston Celtics. And what we see from that is the Boston Celtics now, which are just about winning titles. So if I go to the Brooklyn Nets, I go, let's see if someone's willing to trade the farm. And I think the Warriors would give up enough assets to make this an interesting trade. I actually think I go, this could work out in their favour for what they've been left with, if you know what I mean. Like you said, for the shit that... Yeah. Kevin Durant's taken on their doorstep, they could actually potentially come out of this all right. I guess, look, from my perspective, I guess I come from like a bit of a... I mean, I support, of the NFL teams, probably one of the more conservative in terms of trades and big off-season moves. A team that builds through uh, the draft and builds long-term, hence why they've had consistent success throughout their history. Um, but I also look at... Uh, I guess a player like LeBron James, right? So he's gone to a couple of different franchises and has said, this is what I want to make this work. Um, and sometimes it's, well, it's worked everywhere he's gone and he's won a title everywhere he's yeah. gone. First and foremost, which is important. Uh, but secondly as well, when it hasn't gone 100% right, he's stuck through it. He's stuck in a couple of years in purgatory in Cleveland. He stuck through his first year in LA in purgatory. And then this last year, he stuck with the, with the Lakers. You don't see him out here, like sort of demanding trade, demanding to rebuild. He sort of, he sort of sticks by his word a little bit, if you know what I mean. He sticks it through. Whereas I feel like Durant sort of is very impatient. Like he, if if it doesn't work out within the first year or two, he's just gone. He's just, he's like, I'm out. Uh, And I don't know, just for me, I don't like that too much. I get, I hundred percent get your argument and agree with it. Yeah, if you had have a chance for, you know, three uh, players like uh, Irving, Harden, and uh, and Durant, you you think yeah for sure. But you know, if when Durant went there, he said you know he wants to build something here in Brooklyn with consistent success, and now it's what two years later and <laughs> yeah. he's, he's out. It's like I don't like that for me personally. Not a fan. Yeah. Totally agree. The other big move was actually Rudy Gobert, uh, big man from the Utah mm. Jazz, signed a multi-million, $200 million extension, and then was traded from the Utah Jazz to the Minnesota Timberwolves, which this had the writing was on the wall for this one because uh, Devontae Mitchell and Rudy Gobert, the two stars of the Jazz, I think were at each other's necks. Um, and therefore, I guess right now, uh, it, was, it was always going to happen. So... This is this is kind of what we've got to with them. I think it makes it very interesting to see if the Jazz, uh, if the if the Timberwolves, how this will work because they've got two big men now of Carl Anthony Towns mm. and Gobert, and how that's going to work with spacing on the on the floor. Uh, but yeah, that was the other really big move. Other than that, a lot of signings and stuff like that. The the Joker got the biggest signing in NBA history. Uh, I know Ja Morant resigned. I think Zion Williamson's on his way to resign. He did. So there yeah, you go. So he, I think he did like a super max contract or something. Yeah. Like as much as a super max rookie contract, whatever you get. So yeah. So yeah. So it's a lot of resignings, but those were the two major moves that I think will will shift the landscape of the NBA. Onto Formula One. Now you may not have watched the race this morning, Husey, but if you did in Silverstone. It was one of the best races of the year. And it's the only reason I want to put it on this uh, podcast today is to discuss that, is the fact that we actually got a really good race in England where at a point there was five cars uh, from position two to six battling where anyone could overtake anyone, which hasn't happened in Formula One in a very long time. And it was very good. There was a moment there, and I think a couple of EUI fans have already pointed it out, where if you... The, the camera pans 
over the action, uh, and it must be the helicopter cam or, or the drone footage, whatever mm. they're using, and it's the five cars like literally going around corners for about 13 seconds racing each other, and it's probably it's what Formula One needs and wants and needs to keep pushing for. Um, so that was fantastic racing. The other one from the Formula One this morning was uh, Guang Yang Zhu, uh, I believe I pronounced that all right. Uh, the Chinese driver for Alfa Romeo having one of the yeah. biggest crashes you'll ever see. I don't know. Have you seen that, Husey? I have not yet. I would watch that. And it's, it's, sure a, it's, a, it's a sign of the car flips a few times, ends up skidding along um, on upside down. And it's a, a sign of the, the halo especially, uh, which is the, the, the ring around them. Uh, been very beneficial for the drivers now and actually saving a life, which a few years back was ripped pretty hard for being there, and it's now showing that actually this is the safety of drivers is is the number one most important thing, and it has saved a life. Mm. I would feel again today. Excellent. Any any last words from you, Husey, of the sporting world? NFL slowly creeping back into our our yes. um, our rear view uh, mirrors, our front mirrors. Some breaking news are being announced. Uh, on the social media front and now here on the Sportsbeat podcast, um, Tom Curry is out of the rest of the Wallabies England series with a concussion. Ah, interesting. I did. He took that hit straight yeah. away. See, and again, this is interesting. It's taken them to, after the game, to rule him out. Yeah. So he obviously, they, they never, I don't think he ever got sent for a, a, a head injury assessment after that. Uh, no, I think he was replaced at halftime. Was he? Interesting. Let me have a look. I've got. I've just. I'll have a look on the, the old Google and things like that. Yeah, he was. He was replaced. replaced at um, half time. He was replaced at halftime. He was allowed to play on for the rest of the first half, but he was replaced after halftime. Even that. That's interesting because it happened pretty early on, and I'm surprised he. You know, again with the way rugby and rugby league have to yeah, move. Yeah, it happened head in the. I'm looking at it right here. It happened in the just before 14 minutes in the game. 14 minutes. Yeah, yeah he yeah. ran into Karevi and yeah, was not. Yeah, was not. So that's what an right. extra 26 minutes of you know yep. footy on the field with a head injury is mm-hmm. not a good sign. So interesting. Good for the Wallabies. Um, but I am gonna leave this leave us with this message. I kind of hope the Wallabies lose this one purely for selfish reasons because I'm going to the yep. third game and I want a decider. So <laughs> yeah, I don't often say this. Get up, England. But it's Suncorp decider. though. They're, they're not gonna. It's Suncorp is 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 great territory for is it? Australia. I see. So well, it's no Eden Park. Very, very lost difficult. in twenty eight years, but yeah. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck to you, Wallabies. Anyway, thank you for joining yeah. us on this week of the Sports Booth Podcast, episode twenty eight. We will talk to you again next time. Goodbye. Peace.